It's the power revolution coming to your house soon. We have this handy fusion reactor in the sky called the sun. Okay? You don't have to do anything. It just works. <laughs> Shows up every day and produces ridiculous amounts of power. Power that's plentiful but could never be effectively stored. A breakthrough in battery technology is about to change that. Batteries really signify a complete game changer. Uh, they come in coupled with solar PV that really enable consumers now to become their own mini power stations. It's going to be about the biggest change as we've seen in the telecommunications industry with uh, mobile phones. You can actually go, if you want, completely off-grid. You can take your solar panels, charge the battery packs, and that's, and that's all you use. This month, PayPal billionaire Elon Musk unveiled Powerwall, a cheap lithium-ion battery soon to be churned out on a massive scale in a giant factory being built in Nevada. So as simple as walking over to the power unit, which is supplied by the Powerwall. The solar batteries have been developed from the technology that powers this groundbreaking electric car, the Tesla. We've been able to take solar to battery, battery to car, and as you can see from the release of the power in the car, accelerating from 0 to 100 in just 3.3 seconds, shows that we've got great release from the lithium-ion batteries to power. So uh, we've now got two batteries on the market, the 7 kilowatt hour and the 10 kilowatt hour, 7 kilowatt hour for daily use and 10 kilowatt hour as a backup. Next year, Australia will be Powerwall's prime overseas market, where it's estimated with add-ons it'll retail at about five and a half thousand dollars. The interest in Australia is mainly due to the high uptake of solar in this country and the opportunity. It makes economic sense to have a home battery. It'll happen quicker in Australia than it will happen anywhere else in the world because of our high retail prices. We pay so much just to board a kettle in the city and now we've got a cheaper way of doing it. Imagine low or even no power bills. The new solar battery technology gives consumers control. And that's forcing energy companies to rethink the way they do business. Up in northern Australia, in the tropics, solar power is a bit of a no-brainer. But it's here in a quiet cul-de-sac in suburban Townsville that the local electricity supplier has been running tests in ten houses of solar plus the new revolution batteries. So come on out guys, a battery system that's just been recently installed. We've got For Ergon Energy it's a case of if you can't beat them, join them. So at the moment our solar panels are generating power and coming onto the grid. Um, we've also got excess, there's not much load so the rest of it's going back out to the electricity network on the street. That means Barry and Glenis Lowe are now using battery power and selling their surplus back to the grid. Well, since Dean's put the um, five kilowatt system in, we haven't paid a power bill. Has that surprised you? It did, it did. Um, and there's been some surplus money out of it. In some of Queensland's far-flung rural communities, Ergon is installing localised grids with battery storage to save running transmission lines over vast distances. Similar microgrids are possible in cities. Up here in North Queensland, we're subject to uh, things like cyclones, uh, where we can come in and have widespread devastation. Um, the opportunity here we have in, in this street is that we could potentially test the availability of a microgrid where the mains power went down um, into the street, then the houses in the street could supply energy and trade energy with, amongst each other and still so, stay connected and share their energy. The Tesla battery has Australia's top power companies like AGL scrambling to catch up. Three years ago, it bought out Victoria's biggest brown coal generator, Loy Yang the nation's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. But it also operates the country's largest solar farm at Ningen. Now it's begun offering customers solar panels without upfront fees, and in a few weeks begins to market its own battery. The typical Australian home runs on a circuit that requires about three kilowatts of power. Um, so our battery will allow Australian consumers that have this battery to run their appliances and their air conditioning late in the afternoon off the battery power.
They're recognising that this is going to be the biggest change in their industry in more than a century. So they're trying to engage with the consumer and protect their business. Very soon, households, even apartments and rental homes will be offered bundled plans for their electricity. A mixture of solar, grid and batteries, all tailored for affordable cost and household demand. So instead of just buying kilowatt hours, you'll be getting uh, different product wraps and product mixes. So capped price options, somewhat like telco offerings for mobile phone plans, would be the sort of typical sort of thing you'll start to see. With the price of lithium batteries predicted to fall still further, faster, the switch to solar is likely to accelerate. Solar on people's roofs is an unstoppable force. You have to embrace the new technology, otherwise you will be swept away by it. Matt Peacock with that report. Fifty years ago, most people used to die at home. These days it's fewer than one in five, and a swift catastrophic illness is the exception. Many of us will see our final days or years drawn out in a slow and sometimes humiliating decline, often attached to machines in institutions such as hospitals or nursing homes. One highly accomplished American doctor has spent many years looking at end-of-life care and the process of dying, and he says both doctors and patients should rethink how we manage it. Atul Gawande is a Boston-based surgeon and professor of medicine at Harvard University. His new book is called Being Mortal, and he's in Australia for the Sydney Writers Festival. Thank you very much for making time to speak to us. It's great to be here. A little over 50 years ago, most people died at home, and now it's just 17%. Why is that the case when so many people express a preference to die at home? Well, of course, part of the reason is you never know exactly when that moment is. So in the 1950s, there wasn't a particular reason to go to the hospital because there wasn't a lot discovered that could be done in many instances. Now we've discovered thousands of treatments, medications, approaches that can be taken. And so there's a great faith that, well, if, if we can't cure you, maybe there can be something that we can at least do to bring you back to the way you were. And we in medicine are often willing, unwilling to say, you know, something beyond, well, there's always something we can do, you know, do you want it or not? Do you want us to do something or do you want us to do nothing? And then that kind of choice, you know, often how can you say we're not going to, we should do nothing? But what I found over time was that's just the wrong question. What is the right question? Well, the puzzle is what, what are your priorities besides just living longer? What matters to you? Um, and the easiest way to think about it is what are you willing to sacrifice and what are you not willing to sacrifice for the sake of more time? And people have different answers for that. Um, my father had a, a brain tumor, and, and so we had that conversation about what he was willing to sacrifice and what he wasn't willing to sacrifice. One of my colleagues, her, her father, when she asked him those questions, he said he was willing to go through a lot as long as he could watch football on television and eat chocolate ice cream. <laughs> it was like the best living will ever. My father, he said that's not good enough for him. He wanted to be at the dinner table at home talking to family or friends and if he could at least do that once in a while, once a week, he'd be willing to go through a lot for that. But if we couldn't make that possible, if he was never going to get home, that is not the way he wanted. That he would rather die. He'd rather that we not keep on doing things that prolonged a quality of life that was no longer the reason he would want to be alive. And it was enormously important that we got to have that conversation in advance. The result was he spent the last four months of his life really at home just being a person more than a patient. And that is all too uncommon. We've medicalized mortality, turned it into just another problem to treat, always something more that we could offer without thinking about really what are people's priorities and how do we make sure as they come to their last phase of life that we're making as good a life as possible all the way to the very end and not sacrificing it. It's one thing for us to have this conversation in the abstract here. I imagine it's a very different proposition when you actually have to have it with somebody who's nearing the end of a life. Are doctors well trained to have those conversations? So 
I wrote the book precisely because I found that I wasn't. I opened my book saying that I learned about a lot of things in medical school, but mortality wasn't one of them. And, um, you know, we mostly are trying, we're excited in medicine about learning what diseases people are likely to have, how they work, and how to fix them. And the surprise to me was finding in practice that a large percentage of my patients had problems I really wasn't ever going to be able to fix or make better. They were suffering from the infirmities of aging or a terminal illness. And, um, and we weren't, I, I didn't feel competent in understanding how I take care of the unfixables in people's lives. So I interviewed more than 200 patients and family members about their experiences with serious illness or infirmities. Scores of palliative care experts, nursing home directors, nursing home aides. And I found that there were some real skills that mostly are about recognizing that our job is, I, I thought the job that I had was to try to tell you the facts. You know, here are, here's your prognosis, here are the options, what do you want to do? And in fact, what it is is to help people come to terms with their anxiety about dying, mostly by asking questions that let them put their experience in their own words, like, what's your understanding of where you are? with your condition? What are your fears and worries for the future? What are your priorities if your time becomes short? Hard questions to ask, even harder questions to answer. But I found that you could ask them and that um, they made for you know, an unexpectedly kind of gratifying experience that you could shape the treatment to what people really wanted in their lives. Is there such a thing as a good death? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by the idea of a goal being a good death. Um, there's, there's some extent to which death and dying is never pretty and not in your control. The goal is as good a life as possible all the way to the very end under the circumstances you face. And I think we're often depriving people of that. You know, people are coming to their end often, you know, in an intensive care unit, on a machine, oblivious to the fact that they didn't even know this was going to be their last waking moment on earth. They'd come into the hospital, they didn't know they weren't leaving. They never got to say goodbye. They never got to say, I'm sorry, or I love you, or make any plans like that. And I think we in medicine have overlooked the ways in which that is a form of intense suffering for people, uh, for the family members and the person themselves. And it's not just because of the machines and the misery, al although the suffering, the physical suffering is there, it's also the, the psychic suffering that this is not how people want to go. Are these conversations that are being had in medicine generally or are you sort of out there on your own discussing this stuff? Well, I think there are a few fields like geriatrics, palliative care medicine, hospice care, where the skill of being able to elicit what people's goals and priorities are and match care so that you've you know aligned here's what we've done we've created medicine to be completely narrowly focused often on just the disease you have and fighting the disease rather than thinking about what your goals are what your priorities are in fighting your condition and i think those um, pockets of specialties, geriatrics, palliative care, had developed those skills, but there aren't enough of those people to go around, and part of the reason to write about this is to say these skills have to be ones that other people in medicine have, but then you realize family members themselves can ask these questions. These are not, these are not impossible things to talk about as families.